My name's Hilary Harper. I present the Saturday morning program on ABC Radio Melbourne. And I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging and the elders of any other communities who may be with us today. Now, if you believe the billboards, the Pentridge site is now a vital hub of creativity and commerce interlinked with residential opportunities. There's a childcare centre, it's got a community garden, it might get a cinema soon. And that is why it's such an interesting site, really. It's got everything that modern life uh, throws in, housing pressures, heritage debates, ideas about prisons and justice, uh, morality, class, race, gender divisions. You're in for a thought-provoking evening and there will be time for questions afterwards. We'll ask that you keep them quite succinct. They're uh, squeezed into the last 15 minutes and there are copies of the book up at the readings table at the back. You're know, welcome to uh, purchase one at the end. The guests that you'll be hearing tonight, writer and photographer Rupert Mann, who used to wander over the site after it was a prison, but before it was a vital hub, and that led to his book Pentridge, Voices from the Other Side. He's a cultural and built heritage specialist and co-founder of Melbourne Heritage Action. Jack Charles is an actor, musician and potter who had uh, every significant big zero birthday between 20 and 50 inside the walls. In recent years, he's reconnected with lost family and now as a traditional lawman, he helps Indigenous prisoners look at different ways out. Pat Merlo was a prison officer for 12 years and her book, Screw, Observations and Revelations of a Prison Officer, details her career at Pentridge. And Peter Norden AO was a volunteer and then chaplain at Pentridge from the 70s through to the early 90s. In 2009, he left the priesthood and the church and he's now an adjunct professor at RMIT, most recently teaching on legal and justice issues for young people. Welcome, everyone. I was uh, very struck by this little factoid. When Jesuit Social Services opened the prison for public tours a few months after the last staff and prisoners left, they had to spend $100,000 to bring it in line with basic health and safety standards. What state was it in when the inmates left? Rupert? Ah, oh, well, um, I mean, first time I went into Pentridge was probably four or five years after it, uh, after the prisoners left. Peter can tell you more about this, but... It was run down by then, that's for sure, yeah. There was quite a big gap, wasn't there, between closing in 97 and Vital Community Hub? Yes, there was, uh, yep, yep, absolutely. And so much of it's been lost, really, since then, yeah. And Peter, you spoke at the closing ceremony. What were your thoughts then on, on the, uh, the buildings and the, the institution? Well, I'd been waiting for a long time for it to close, probably about 20 years since I'd been visiting there and thought the place should have closed decades before. Uh, but I did speak at the closing ceremony and one of the things I said, every cell in this place has been wept in and every cell in this place has been prayed in too. Uh, but uh, a very moving moment, but uh, it should have happened probably decades uh, before. The book is really interesting. It, it tells about that some of the older divisions having tiny little holes that were discovered barely enough room to crouch in. When was the last time they were used? Oh, look, I don't know. I mean, Pat worked in this division as a prison officer, but my understanding is that though this is way down in the basement of, of B Division. There are small holding cells, but just recently, uh, someone I know that was working there discovered they would lift up a piece of the floor, a slab of the floor, and there was a, a little chamber under there just big enough for someone to crouch in. Wouldn't have been used for a long time, I hope, Pat. <laughs> the biggest belief, doesn't it, the last flogging was there in 1958, in yes. living memory, the last yep. two executions in Victoria, male and female. I mean, how fast does a prison, can a prison system change? Oh, well, uh, I think Peter's the man to talk about that. Anyone should feel free to leap in at any point, <laughs> if you wish. Yeah, modern prison system. Yeah. Um, look, institutions take a long time to change, sometimes centuries. Um, and uh, the modern systems uh, look better, um, but are they any better? That's uh, one of the questions that Rupert addresses in the book or one of his writers addresses, particularly in the last chapter. And we might talk a little bit more about that, about mm. the, uh, the difference between a modern clean prison and, and Pentridge type of prison. Jack, can I ask you, how did Rupert persuade you to go back and what was it like when you got there? Oh, it didn't take much persuading, I don't think. Um, but uh, yeah, we snuck in uh, um, into V Division. 
and he took photos of me on a wall, you know, coming down outside. But uh, it was amazing to see how dusty, how dust collects over a period of time in a, uh, in a, uh, a, a division that was full of life and that was always kept clean with the local, with the, uh, the, the billet, the cleaners and etc. And uh, the walls uh, washed and that, so that, uh, that paint gleamed and the floors, you can, uh, you know, were swept so clean and mopped and the cells had to be clean and mopped out too. Otherwise there were certain punishments, uh, you know, loss of certain privileges and your TV taken away and etc. So I was amazed at, uh, you know, how it had been left to rot and ruin like that and collect dust. Uh, and uh, I marvelled at the way uh, we snuck in on that Sunday. Um, you know, um, well, this uh, new uh, um, apartments just right opposite uh, the gate where we snuck in. Uh, and we were frightened that people would look down and uh, spot us. And, you know, so uh, I'd be, you know, be, be, be uh, arrested for uh, break and entry. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, you know. Uh, uh, but... Um, Look, uh, you know, they, it's been used. Uh, you know, uh, they did a um, um, couple of movies in that place. I, I can only imagine the um, uh, the the, the, um, uh, the staff and the, the movie people. You know, have a good big job of them to clean up the areas that they were going to be used to make uh, a stir, for instance, and film Motherwell. And, and I, was, I heard about it, and I wanted to be in it, but I was in jail for real. I couldn't. I, was, I wasn't cast, of course, because I was doing time elsewhere. <laughs> you were perfect. <laughs> you were robbed. But no, I did theatre there and all that kind of stuff, and I went in there and the old young offenders group was into the yard there, and and um, everybody, you know, I knew. Um, there were a lot of other failed, adopted and fostered kids that had ended up going to Tirana and then the next step from Tirana is into, um, into Pendridge. And so it was an easy passage for the likes of myself to go in. Um, I felt a measure of protection, etc. And uh, so, and, and it was, you know, the long run, doing all that jail time, you know, off and on in Pendridge, you know, it was, it was you know, some kind of respite for me. I think I'm still alive because, you know, I was forced, uh, you know, by the count of the courts to uh, undertake this uh, little measure of, um, of uh, respite. Yeah. Well, it's another word for sentence. And, you know. It's really interesting in the book because some prisoners talked about really hating lockdown and that sense of isolation and being cut off from the world and from time. But for you, it sounded like a period of quiet reflection. Oh, what did I you run, think about you know, I was I unravelled in there. It was really fun, you know. Uh, uh, you know, because uh, it, it didn't take long after you're going in on my addicted uh, years, going in, uh, I always refused the methadone treatment. Now, how ironic that uh, I'd moved into a block of land here, I mean, into an elderly block of residences off Westgarth Street over in Northcote, and my uh, neighbour is an ex-prison officer. <laughs> 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 he, was, he was Dr Death's nurse and that. And he did come around and uh, pulled down my trapdoor on many nights and he said, Jack, do you want some methadone? And I always told him to stick it where the sunshine don't shine, you know, because <laughs> I was against methadone. I, 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 you know, so I was quietly, you know, internalised everything on the first few days of going into Pantridge or any, in, any, any jail and uh, I would come good because there was a need for me to come good from my own point of view and from the point of view of uh, prisoners uh, accessing uh, me for one cause or a reason or another. I hope you're going to give the prison officer a cake with a file in it for Christmas over the fence, good neighbour. <laughs> <laughs> no, now, no, they always bought, you know, they always had to pay top dollar to get pottery, pottery from my pottery shop. <laughs> <laughs> I insisted they paid a full price and that, you know. And, uh, you know, I called my pottery shop. I didn't have it in Petries, but I would have loved to have had my pottery shop Psycho Ceramica <laughs> in Pentridge. It would have been a great brand name, Psycho Ceramica Pentridge. <laughs> now, Pat, you worked there for a long time. What was it like to be in that relationship where you had power over other people, but there were also complications between the officers as well? I think probably when I started there was uh, just after um, 
fairly it had that major fire and the women were transferred to Pentridge, which was uh, B Annex, a wing off B Division. Um, we entered not just the prisoners, but the female officers as well. We entered into a man's world. Um, it was run by men. Uh, the men lived in it and we were like intruders. Uh, that is including the prison officers. We were treated um, uh, as a lower rate person. The prisoners were pre uh, treated obviously as lower than that. Um, and it was pretty difficult, but um, we were there for eight years or six, seven years, I think. Um, and I think the women prison officers uh, proved that they could hold their own as, as well as the men. But um, it certainly was a shock to me. Um, it, it was like a city within a city. It had roads, it had hospitals. It was, as Jack said, it was spotless as cells, but the, the prisoners were hired as billets. Um, the, the trusted prisoners were given those jobs that would clean the chief's offices and um, the senior's offices, and they weren't all that honest, but um, I had my lunch stolen probably about a dozen times. Um, but the billet, I mean, when you're working in a wing with the same people day in and day out, although I shifted to every division from right through Pentridge and um, the Metropolitan and JICA, um, you do get to, to know which prisoner. You've got to be very, very firm, but extremely fair. It took me a long time how to work things out. Um, I can remember walking down and walking into a cell with about five prisoners and I couldn't believe. I said, you guys are going to die with all this cigarette smell in, you know, the smoke. And then five minutes later, they were all charged with smoking marijuana. I didn't even know it was marijuana. I'd never seen <laughs> drugs before. But as the years went on, you know, I learned a lot. I seen some disgraceful things. I seen some very good times. I enjoyed being on the um, education council to help the prisoners. I enjoyed starting the horticulture program down with the women and, um, you know, I had a lot of good times as well as pretty sad times. Well, and Pat, you tell a fantastic story in the book about watching some prisoners sit a horticultural exam and seeing some pretty interesting oh stuff happen. Oh, my God. I thought I was going to get the sack that day. We were in K Division. It was a um, drug treatment unit and one of the um, education... It's the old Jica Jica, isn't it? Yes. The old Jica Jica. Yeah, they turned that into K Division after the fires. Um, and they had a horticulture program, and it was a, quite a lengthy program, and this prisoner had only been there four weeks, and he wanted to join the program and get a certificate to show to his parents on visits. They get a kick out of that. And Anyway, prior to the exam, the teacher went up with the whiteboard and wrote down all the answers and, you know, went through a refresh court, uh, course, and um, they went down this spine and I'm sitting outside and all the prisoners are sitting there. The teacher's got his back to me and the next minute the whiteboard had come across. They were all looking up, <laughs> looking up. And, and the teacher noticed something was going on, you know, and the board had moved and I was going... And I'm saying to the guys outside, you get out of here, oh, I was nearly having a heart attack. And however, the whole lot passed and they, uh, <laughs> and look, it was a joy to, when they went out to their visits to, um, to show the certificates. They got a kick out of it, their parents got a kick out of it, their wives got a kick out of it, yeah. because they'd accomplished something. Maybe none of them have ever accomplished anything before. But by the living Jesus did it. Um, <laughs> oh, I nearly had a heart attack that day. But that was fun. That yeah. was dishonest, but fun. Yeah. There's some fascinating moments in the book where you, Rupert, you write about the little resistances that people had. They, you know, they did bronze ups, for example. Tell us what a bronze up is. Oh, well, look, I should say I've never been to prison. I can't talk about this stuff from personal experience, but I, I can tell you what I've heard I've from... I've seen it. Yeah, <laughs> Pat's seen it. I think Peter knows all about it from Jika Jika. But it was a form of protest where, you know, uh, when everything's taken off you, all you've got control over is your body. So you take your shit and you smear it on the walls, up and down the walls. 
uh, a bronze up. Peter, Peter and Pat can tell you more about that, I think. I wouldn't use your terminology, but yes. <laughs> well, it sounds like, you know, yeah, people found these little gaps. They, they made sex toys out of porridge, which is uh -huh. unbelievable but true. And they, um, but they were in, in response to these tiny little horrible humiliations, like turning the lights out early so you couldn't finish your book, mm. hanging Ronald Ryan a minute early, mm. a minute less of life so that, you know, he couldn't even rely on that. And, um, have, you know having the toilets visible in public. What, I mean, is, is, it, is that something that's necessary in a prison? Is it necessary, perhaps Peter, you're the best person to answer this, is it necessary to have those humiliations or can you have a prison system that finds the middle ground? Uh, there are prison systems that um, are quite different, um, that are successful, not in America uh, so much, or not, not in England, but in places I visited, Sweden, Holland, 1990, uh, where they deal with the issues, um, keep people out of prison for the first part, you know, unless they need to go there. Uh, but that humiliation was part of the, uh, the culture that had developed. And I think Rupert, while well, he says he hadn't been in prison, he got into the, the minds of 15 people who lived or worked there, and as a good photographer and as a good archaeologist, he was able to discover that and give expression to it in, the, in, in his writings. Uh, and the 15 people he chose, uh, several ex-prisoners uh, and a senior governor, uh, a few of whom have since died, uh, they've uh, been able to articulate, if you like, in a more critical and analytical way what was wrong with the place. But no one cared uh, at the time. No one cares much at the time now. Um, and, uh, but it costs a huge amount of money and it costs, has enormous social cost as well if you have a prison system that's not working effectively. You uh, had to, you were there during the Jika Jika fire or mm -hmm. straight afterwards. Did that have an effect on your decision to stop doing that kind of work? Not really, no. It, uh, I think any of those, it was 87 um, and I, uh, I worked there as chaplain from 85 to 92. Um, but it, uh, it did, uh, I tried to express in, the, in, in my little chapter uh, when I was called uh, to anoint the five bodies, I, I knelt down on the ground, I looked up at the razor ribbon wire and I recognised that this was a prison system that was destructive of human life. Now these people who died in a protest, they themselves had taken human life, uh, but here is the state, the authority, Her Majesty's prison, uh, acting in a way that was going to further brutalise people and bring about further harm, more victims in the future, because those fellows died in prison, but 99% are released. Well, and some of the public reaction to bad things that happen in prison seems to be, oh, well, they forfeited their rights to safety because they've committed crimes. It's, uh, you've talked about our thinking being irrational about prisons. Is that part of what the problem? It's a mentality that's uh, through and through part of Australian culture. Maybe it reflects our prison past. Uh, it's, uh, transportation only finished in Western Australia in 1867. And uh, it's not in living memory, but uh, I think we're still uh, affected by that culture. It's so different in other parts of the world, as I mentioned, uh, particularly in Northern Europe. Uh, so I don't think we want to criticise prisons. I think people are prepared to turn a blind eye. Well, I remember you, you writing at one point that the term do-gooder was looked down upon hugely. It was seen as soft and useless in a prison setting. Mm. What implications does that have for change within the prison system? Uh, yes, it's the things that, you know, to be good-hearted was a term of abuse. Think about that. And uh, I first went there as a 26-year-old trainee pro-social work graduate uh, and, you know, idealistic, I guess, and fairly inexperienced at the time. But uh, think of the impact of that, that a do-gooder, a bleeding heart, uh, a bleeding heart <laughs> surely should be something positive and constructive in our society, especially if you're trying to prevent crime uh, and avoid reoffending of people being released. So it was a reversal of the sort of humane values uh, that, that we uh, normally accept in our, our society. And then the reform movement came along and talked about humane containment. But you have to examine what the scratch beneath the surface to see what, was, what is really going on even now. And I wonder if you would mind telling us about the sacrificial lambs. 
Oh, um, well, uh, I was, uh, before I was prison chaplain, I started a halfway house called the Brosnan Centre for 17 to 21 year olds. And, uh, so I had a particular concern prior to being prison chaplain about protecting the vulnerable and the weak. But when I was there as prison chaplain, you know, more than uh, on frequent occasions, I saw vulnerable young 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds put into places like B Division, which was the gangsters division. And uh, I really questioned why this was done. Uh, and there was a lot of manipulation of vulnerable young men in the prison and vulnerable young women in the women's prison as well. Uh, you know, I, I can't prove this, but I, I did have that strong hunch that there were certain sacrificial lambs that were placed in those divisions uh, to keep the heavies quiet uh, as, uh, as victims of sexual assault, I mean. Uh, now, most of it was never seen. You know, there were rapes, but mostly the, these were silent, hidden activities that went on in an all-male all prison. Uh, but you might think it's um, exaggerating, but when, you, when you're in there day in and day out, and I've never had the experience that Jack's had, because I used to leave at four o'clock every afternoon. Uh, but, you know, you, if you're observant, you notice things. Did you feel safe in your cell, Jack? Um, uh, most of the time, most of the time. I mean, uh, the first instance I walked in there and was a young kid, I, um, in the yard yard, I had to, this bigger bloke, uh, a bunch of them come up to me admiring my uh, oxblood pointy toed shoes and that. And uh, they were saying, oh, well, I like your shoes, mate. And it, apparently I didn't know that it was code for I want them given to me. <laughs> a bit of a standover and that, you know. Uh, but, it, it, you know, if, uh, uh, I don't know, I must have had somebody keeping a, a watch over me because I was suddenly protected by a bunch of uh, other Indigenous people. I never knew them, but they were related to me, you know, ironically. But uh, they said, uh, no, leave this, this kid alone, you know. He, he likes his shoes, you want to keep them, so piss off and things like that, you know. So, so I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm little, you know, and uh, I speak the Queen's English pretty good when I went in there. So I was called upon to write letters for many of them. And in the days when we had uh, uh, pen and ink in the uh, D division and that, you know, and to clear the dining areas, and that's where I, I would be called in to write a couple of letters for a couple of people. And that, the scribe I was. <laughs> no money for it, but I got a lot of uh, extra burgoo, porridge. Burgoo. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and bread rolls. And, and of course, Pentridge rolls and that, you know, were, uh, uh, you know, uh, traditionally had always won the market at the local, uh, when they put their, uh, uh, their, uh, their rolls up and their, their breads up for consideration at some uh, iconic uh, festival and that, they always won the awards at Pentridge and that. Yeah. That's <laughs> and I should thing. say as well that, you know, of, um, of the people who agreed to be in the book, um, you know, I, I reckon I interviewed maybe three times more that number of people, mm. spoke to them, and many just didn't want to be part of the book. They wouldn't go back to Pentridge. The last thing they wanted to do was be photographed there or talk about it. And I think for many people, Pentridge left such a deep scar and many deep wounds that you know, the, the idea of being part of a book like this was, was terrible. And that's not to say that the people who, did, who were part of the book uh, didn't have deep wounds, absolutely. But I think it's testament to the strength of these people's resilience, the strength of their character and their spirit, that they're able to stand here and talk about these events, talk about how they survived Pentridge in many ways. And the fact that with my own case uh, that I uh, have never, I've always felt the need to go back to prisons. It's a, uh, once I, um, um, a Varsity came out, uh, the documentary, I had this enormous passion to get back into prisons. How would I go about it? Paul mm. Bastard is surely a platform, pathway back into prisons for me. But no, it took a long time trying to convince, writing letters in my own way to the uh, Dickie Wynn, local minister for Aboriginal affairs and the office of housing uh, rep and that, you know. So I tried desperately to uh, get back into prisons and that. Uh, so I'm not, you know, I'm not the full quid, I know, but, you know. <laughs> I, I, once I, I acknowledged and found the full extent of my heritage, 
I believe that I ought to be going back in, sharing the journey with others that are lost, you know, uh, so stolen generations of the, the stolen generations and etc. and their progeny, they're in there trapped with little knowledge of who they are, who do they think they are. So the idea now, uh, with the, I now work as a board member of the Archie Roach Foundation and a special roving ambassador. You know, I've taken over Foley's job here in Victoria as the mouth in the south. <laughs> and uh, so I, I flagged the Archie Roach Foundation uh, for, you know, to as many places and to as many people far and wide across the landscape, overseas too, uh, in, in the vain hope that, uh, you know, that uh, the penny will drop for uh, Danny Boy, Daniel Andrews, the Office of Corrections, uh, to uh, take me seriously enough because... Uh, you know, it's about time that we had uh, uh, paid elders from the local community wherever, uh, you know, a, 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 an institution is built to house and incarcerate uh, Indigenous people. You know, we're seeking to uh, have paid elders uh, registered and going in there at will whenever they want. So. Well, there's still 12% of the prison population is Indigenous. It hasn't changed since the 90s. No. What do those kids need when you go in and talk to them? What do they well, want well, to hear from Well, they rush you? up to us. They're hungry. To uh, you know, to uh, inform, <laughs> dob in, uh, tell of their woes and all that kind of stuff. The frustration they feel, you know, and especially, you know, with the now the reports have come out, you know, about the uh, uh, royal commissions into uh, uh, the, the uh, Dondale, Parkville, uh -huh. and uh, or the series of inquiries, I should say, into Dondale, um, uh, Vic uh, Parkville, and Mar Malmesbury, and the outcome was that there were seemed uh, by the, uh, the report that there was very little evidence of any rehabilitation programs over all these years being delivered into uh, uh, both Tarada and uh, Parkfield and, uh, and uh, Malmesbury. And uh, I think that was so up in uh, Dondale. So, you know, Northern Territory has a new policy now, less punitive measures. We're seeking to have this under the Archie Roach Foundation. We want a, a seat you know, or uh, to have a, an observance in the court of the processes uh, of uh, maybe heading off the young ones and, or some others too, that uh, jail isn't necessary to, for these people. You, if they're a part of a, uh, of a, of a mob that, uh, you know, sat in the back seat of a stolen car, well, those people shouldn't be going to jail. They didn't steal the car they were in, you know, cahoots with somebody that had stolen a car. And there's many people that are in our prison system like that. So um, we want to, there's, there's, a, there, there's a lot of movements I know in the state of Victoria with Aboriginal Legal Service to start working on uh, uh, eradicating uh, criminal records of the extreme young. We don't, they don't need them. It's a, it's a, a pitfall for their future, impediment to, for, for to, to, uh, you know, the stepway toward, you know, on their pathway and that day. So, so uh, there, there, there's, there is a lot happening and we're only at the very beginning of it. So we, we, we need more talks. We've flagged it out often enough now for over a year. So we reckon a year's good enough. We've done the talk. Now we need to do the walk and, uh, you know, set a have a round table conference with uh, uh, somebody up in Spring Street, a few people in Spring Street. But we have had our meeting here in Victoria last week with Aboriginal Justice, signed a stack deck. So we seem to be, you know, by the system being taken seriously. We have a future. Yes. Mm. And I wish that we had something like that, you know, for Indigenous people, you know, in, the, in Pentridge and et cetera like that. Look, so just a further thing. I managed to slip in under the radar some good measures and that. And one of the most ones, important ones, was that um, I told the doctor who used to come in from the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service uh, every week or fortnight it was, and he'd see to us and et cetera. But I told, I, I told him, look, I just saw uh, uh, 17 people using one syringe. Five of them are Aboriginals and that. So he gave me a bag full of fresh uh, a brown bag, <laughs> as you get from the needle exchanges, <laughs> full of uh, a dozen uh, fresh new uh, 
uh, syringes to, for me to take back to the yard. And I don't know, Bunjil, our great creator, must have been flying over to prison at the time, keeping a black watch on me, making sure that I can go from one division to another and not be searched. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, so I was able to give those fresh bits away, those, those syringes away to those that I thought, be, you know, trying to head them off at, uh, you know, uh, uh, HIV and other bloodborne diseases. Let's talk a little bit about how much progress we might have made there. There's a lot about modern prisons in the book and whether or not they're better or different. Um, Peter, you've said that's just a different kind of harm. What do you mean by that? Well, the, the old prisons are mostly gone, the old blue stones that were built in the 1850s onwards, um, designed a century or two before. So we've got new prisons, but when the Pentridge closed in 96, 97, there were less than 2,000 people in prison in Victoria. In 20 years, it's getting on to 8,000. Now, our population hasn't increased four times since in 20 years. So the prison population, not only in Victoria, but throughout the country has been increasing at four times the rate of the national population for 20 years. So, look, I know some terrible crims, and I know some people who have committed terrible crimes and have caused enormous suffering on people. Uh, but, you know, my experience looking back on it is that 70, even 80 per cent of people in prison in Australia today shouldn't be in there. Uh, you know, the, the issues have got to be diverted early on. Uh, you've got to, it's not about reforming prisons, it's about diverting kids, like the ones that um, Jack's talking about, uh, access to good education, transition to work, communities that are livable, uh, you know, dealing with mental health through mental health services. Uh, now, we see the extremes in the Northern Territory because in the Northern Territory we don't have all the services we've got in Victoria or in New South Wales. So the police have to do everything. So all those social problems get sucked into the criminal justice system and they've got an 1,100 bed prison for 200,000 people. Now, we're nothing like that. But what we've seen over the last 20 years is something very similar. Uh, and the cost, financial and social, is extraordinary. Craig Minogue had some really interesting things to say and, you know, he's still in prison. He's in a modern, clean prison, which he thought was somehow a bit deceptive, you know. Pentridge was open about its brutality, but the brutality was different in this one. And he said that the programs to affess, uh, address offenders' psychology and behaviour, he thought they were part of the system's push to control people. They normalised the gaze of disciplinary power. He's obviously been reading his Foucault, mm -hmm. got a lot of time. But um, is he right? I mean, are the programs that are designed to theoretically help people change their behaviour mm -hmm. part of the oppressive nature of prisons? Well, you'd have to say there are better programs around sex offending and drug treatment and mental health. Uh, but really, if you think those programs are going to be effective in an intellectually, physically, emotionally sterile environment, I mean, look at female prisoners, and Pat can speak about this uh, with authority. Uh, there's a huge number of female prisoners go through those programs, and within a month of their going out, they've overdosed or suicided. So the real issue is you can't deal with the issues of drug addiction in an unreal environment when your real issue is affordable housing or domestic violence or abuse that occurred when you're a child. I mean, th these are issues that have got, got to be dealt with in the community. Now, clearly, you know, certain people have to be taken out of circulation, but not 8,000 in Victoria at the present time. And, uh, you know, if you're really concerned about crime prevention, you'd be saying, well, where's that money coming from? It's coming from transport, welfare, housing, health, the arts. You know, there's a limited budget in Victoria, but um, no one, I'd say less than five, ten percent of the community are really concerned about that. I found it really interesting, Rupert, that you, um, you represented some of the stories in the book in ways that omitted some of the uh, aspects of the crimes that people had committed. For example, um, Billy Longley was a gentle, jovial old man and a bit of a knockabout and a free thinker. He had him chuckling over the story of the stabbing, good memories. Um, and John Dixon Jenkins, he had his sort of autobiographical comic, um, which was pretty self-aggrandising, you know, by the effort of his indomitable will, he survived. I survived, obviously. Is it necessary to somehow represent inmates as nice guys in order to get people to change their minds, or was this a, a strategy for a different reason? 
No, that that definitely wasn't the strategy. Um, you know, I approached this project um, as I approached all these people, uh, which was really to meet them fresh. Um, yeah, they, they, all these people uh, have a past. We all have a past. It was really my role in the book to not pass judgment. I was in no position to do it. Um, and so, you know, I, uh, I approached people like Billy Longley, and the man I knew was, was as I describe him in the book. Other people know him differently. Um, the question is, do you believe what other people say, or do you trust your own experience? There's, there's arguments both ways on that. And Jack, so, you're nodding. Do you, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, well, it's the same. You know, just a uh, meal. Our, our engagement's over that eight-year period. Yeah. You know, his eyes were opened. I led him into a world that he'd never, ever, he'd seen on the fringe of, you know, Australian society, but into an Aboriginal, you know, uh, Collingwood Fitzroy was a great big eye opener. And uh, uh, so he saw many things, heard many things, recorded it all still. And that, and um, um, it was cathartic for me anyway, just to get rid of it and to have it acknowledged that I had recorded, he had recorded uh, some inappropriate uh, uh, stuff that I was saying on the telephone or in front of a camera, and etc. But uh, he did me justice with the final editing of Bastardy, the documentary. And Rupert, you're really concerned with how Pentridge, the site, is represented as well as the people in there. Yeah. What do you think should happen or should have happened? Should that site be sacrosanct? Uh, no, it shouldn't be sacrosanct at all. Um, should have been developed? Absolutely. But it's really about how you do it. And I think what's happened at Pentridge is the, the clock's been turned back and you no longer can read in that site really any of the spaces, the textures, uh, the graffiti, the buildings that date to after 1900 which is the prison that all these people up here knew. Um, so what, you've, what has effectively happened is the lived experience and, and the rich, awful, but also hopeful and, um, and uplifting stories of Pentridge aren't readable in that fabric anymore. It's gone. And so, yeah, it's, it's been made into a kind of uh, unthreatening Ned Kelly era prison in order to make it palatable um, and... and People might want to live there then. But, you know, people, uh, the last recorded suicide happened in Pentridge a few months before it closed. And uh, people one day will be sitting in there um, drinking cocktails. But beneath those new layers of paint, there are, you know, uh, layers of shit probably on the walls, blood, uh, vomit, who knows what, all the rest of it sitting there. I like that idea. It to be honest with you. It would be the prison officer's job to clean that. Right? Oh, sorry, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> We've been promised an interpretive exercise by the developers. I can't wait to see how that turns out. Mm. And, Pat, I mean, you, you talk about that, uh, that having to clean up those things, and you were talking earlier in the green room about some of the things you'd seen producing this visceral reaction You know, made you want to throw up. But the memory that stuck with you most was something uh, less visceral, but it, it got its hooks into you, didn't it? Tell mm. us about Phyllis. Um, well, see, BNX, I'll, I'll just quickly explain this. Mm. BNX um, was the only place in, at the time in Pentridge that housed the women. Now, they were both sentenced, remand, murderers, drug addicts, 70-year-old uh, women that had done something maybe taken on the government and taken too much pension or whatever. But they're all lumped into one. And it was totally unfair of a young girl of 19 who was uh, nominated to be a driver home from a party and she was only just over 0.05. And she had become involved in an accident where someone got killed. Now, because she was over 0.5, she was put in there for some six months or something, never done a thing wrong in her life, and there should have been something else. But however, getting back to Phyllis, Phyllis was a, a murderer. Um, she was apparently battered by her husband, a, a middle-aged woman, battered by her husband, and one night I think she hit him over the head or something, and anyway, he was dead the next door, uh, morning, to cut a long, a long story short. And they actually found her uh, psychiatric insane to plea or whatever and put her into a mental home for some four years. 
She had in the meantime thrown herself under a train and lost half a leg. And after so long, they brought her back to be annex and said she was fit to plea. And of course she was, um, she just couldn't handle it. She, she couldn't stand it. And then she started playing up and causing problems with other prisoners. And it's, a, it's quite a long story, but in the end she was put into an observation cell, which was management. She'd been waiting on a letter from her son Yeah, anyway, everything gets taken off them. She'd been waiting on a letter and um, she wanted her glasses. And I went up to the chief and the chief said, no, she's not having her glasses because she might slash up. I said, if I stand there and read, uh, um, watch her read them and then bring the glasses back. No, it's muster time. I said, no. So I went back and she was on one knee you know, saying, I want to read this letter. And I said, Phyllis, let me read it to you. And um, she wouldn't let me. And I had to slam the door in her face. And the next morning I came back through the, through the main gate and staff were there saying, oh, you lost one last night. And I'm wondering, what the hell are they talking about? And when I walked into the annex, there was, you know, a few jokes and that, oh, well, she won't be throwing her vomit and you won't have to go and... I used to always have to go and get her leg out of the dump master. No one else would do it. I'd just, or, or new prisoners had come in and I used to say, that's your job to get her leg out of the dump master. Um, however, um, it was her that hung herself. And they just said, you know, we won't be getting vomit thrown at us anymore. And I just could not believe that the attitude of those staff, don't think I was looking through rose-coloured glasses either. I was a pretty firm officer. But she never, ever got to read that letter. And it saddened me. Hmm. And that was over 20 years ago, and it's the only thing that upsets me about that whole job, that she never read the letter. And, you know, she, she should have read that letter. And, Pat, I got the because impression... Because she was someone's mother. And I got the impression that you thought about that while you were bringing up your son in later years too. Look, I've never been... I don't speak about it. It upsets me a little bit still because she wasn't just a prisoner. She, she was a family member. Um, you know, it was just... It was the letter that she didn't get to read that she'd waited on for about two weeks. And um, so that, that upset me. But... I hope no prison officers are watching this. They'd think I was crazy. But, um, no, I was, I was saddened by that. That's about, even after the hangings I've seen, I've seen slash-ups, I've seen people with their throat cut, people with their ears bitten off, I've been bashed shitless myself. But that was still the hardest part for me to, um, to handle. And, and I don't like talking about it, so I shouldn't have... I don't know why you brought it but, up. It's so, you know, I, I want to say that, you know, for me, one of the great um, privileges of doing this book was to actually uh, see someone like Pat, and there's many other instances of, instances of this in the book, where they do actually talk about that difficult past, and they face it. They face it and they talk about it. And to me, that's the great lesson from this book, that, you know, dark history uh, has to be faced. There's no point in burying it, which is what the developers are doing as far as I could see. Um, by facing it, you, in some way, I hope, reduce its power over you. I want to finish up by asking uh, Jack, Pat and Peter what you would like to see done with the site in order to help us remember and learn. What's a thing you would like to see happen? When the prison closed in 96, 97, I organised public tours, had 350,000 people through and uh, over 10,000 people every Sunday would come through. Um, for, and it was a bit of a fundraiser, but it was more community education. But we refused to have parties. Um, you know, the university colleges wanted to have a, a big ball there. They offered us 20 grand for the night. We said no. Uh, so I think that's one thing that I'd say that I think Rupert would have said in his preface as well. Some of the entertainment activities that go on there now I think are completely out of place. Jack? 
Um, I don't go up there often, um, uh, so uh, I'm glad to see that it, it's gone. I, uh, uh, it's, um, it was an incredible experience uh, having survived uh, without a scar, you know, noticeable star, scar, and even those scars unnoticeable. But um, it's, um, uh, I don't know what you do with a place like that. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the other old jails, Casamane, Bendigo, uh, are now being, uh, you know, they're all built on Aboriginal land, on the original stomping grounds, and that. And one way to help eradicate any sense of indigenousness across the land up there in Coburg was to build a prison, was to build a church, was to build a police station, and etc. So, you know, I like uh, with Castlemaine Jail, my, reputed to be my favourite jail, uh, <laughs> and you can have favourites, and, and, and Bendigo Jail, these now still are gathering places. You know, there's performance pieces and festivals up in the old Castlemaine Jail and, and uh, you know, Castlemaine Festival times and I've gone up there and pe uh, performed backstage, ironically used my old cell as my dressing room <laughs> and that, uh, you know, jails like this uh, uh, yeah, and the, the, the Bendigo Jail, well, it's just, uh, you know, got this 1,000-seater state-of-the-art theatre built directly, you know, on the, on the, on the part of the jail where the original education unit was. And it's my second favourite jail because I got all my, you know, significant education qualifications there, third, fourth, fifth and sixth form. So, and here I am performing the first play or performance piece acknowledging the Jar Jar Wurrung story, stories uh, of, uh, you know, opening that uh, particular space. So it's good to see, uh, you know, small jails like that, you know, invested in uh, becoming uh, local, you know, rather than being handed over to developers, uh, local councils have kept uh, because there's some heritage, you know, importance here. And, uh, you know, my cell, often in Castlemaine Jail, you know, the tourists go through there and they, they love to have a selfie of themselves in my cell, you know, <laughs> because I was in there, you know. That's a hoot, you know. But what you do up here, you know, I would have loved to have seen F Division maintained and kept because that was seriously one of the most dangerous wings, you know, from my observations in, uh, uh, in uh, D Division, I did that, that side of the prison, you know. Well, F Division was dormitories, was it dormitories, not? Dormitories, yeah, yeah. They are the most dangerous, same yeah. as E Division. Yeah. And I saw many inappropriate things and I had so to deal with some people myself and that, and I'm not much of a, a strong, physical, violent person and that, but I, you know, you get forced into these situations where you do have to uh, take uh, take take uh, things in hand yourself, and you do have to be a, a right old bastard, and that, you know. Uh, but you know, I'm only you know two centimetres short of five foot, so you know, it was always a worry when I started to to to, to show my angst against somebody who's giving me a you know a horrid time, you know, and. Um, I find that every occasion that I, 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 was, I, I, I seem to have been backed up by many people which caused the, uh, uh, the, the person that I was having a go at and his friends, um, some, uh, you know, they, they'd back away and that. But, you know, I spent many sleepless nights in F Division because you had to watch your back and that was really dangerous. And, you know, I'm fair game for anybody, you know. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, could be seen as a beautiful little fella, you know. <laughs> so I mean, to be taken advantage of, speaks the Queen's English, you must be a poof, you know. So, so I, I get that handed out to me, but you know, I just shrug it off and uh, talk to them as though they're humans, people, like I talked to the prison officers, and I got on by, I got on well. So it was never really threatening. But, you know, if it still stands, I would dearly love to have that uh, that uh, uh, mural of um, uh -huh. of what's Donald the name there, uh, ba ba uh, Benny Ball, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, Benny Ball's uh, you know a mural there. Yep. I think they were going to keep it. I think they are. I think it's listed on the heritage register. Yes, luckily. yes, yes, yes. 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 And we because will have it's part uh, of our stories too. You know, at a time built, you know, when the the state of Victoria 
was uh, policed by the uh, Victorian Native Police Force. Uh, many of my great, great, greats were members of the Victorian Native Police Force. And Jack, you I know, know you're a shy and trying type, oh, but we might have uh, <laughs> keep a few <laughs> moments for questions. I just quickly want to ask Pat if you've got anything to add about how you'd like the site remembered. Well, I'm just, uh, as Peter said, pleased to see that um, Pentridge has closed because it, it was outdated, of course. Um, what, what Peter was talking about, the numbers, I would put down to the majority of the problem we have with the drugs. Anyone's children can be on drugs, it doesn't matter who you are. Now, if they must put them in jail, which the courts are doing, what I've always suggested right from the start, particularly when I worked in the drug treatment unit at JICA, uh, sorry, K-Division, um, they'd all want to continue on and go to Odyssey House or some other drug rehab, but there was always a six-month wait. I mean, yeah, OK, I'll just go and down St Kilda, wherever I'm going to go for six months, and then I'll go and restart. What they needed was a corridor, some type of... It would be a lot cheaper, I think, as Pete was talking about, to try and help these people, OK, for them to do their time if they've committed a crime. But let's just try and help them because it could be your son, your daughter, whatever. Um, so I'm just pleased that um, Pentry isn't there and there's, that there are better facilities for them, even though it is still... They've lost their freedom. And its legacy is obviously still being written. Thank you so much for talking about those experiences tonight and I hope you'll stick around and answer some questions for us. We've got two people with microphones ready to take your questions, so stick a hand up and uh, they'll be with you very shortly. And a reminder too that the readings table is up the back and uh, the book is right up there. G'day Peter, Pat, look and well Jack. Thank you. How are you? Uh, good mate, good, good, good. We can't see who you are. Senior prison officer, Dennis Bear. Oh, I got well, on hello, you, Dennis. Dennis. How are you, Pat? <laughs> Good. Yeah. Look, it's just a few things that uh, took my attention. That um, I worked in D Division, F Division, G Division, 15 years. And, uh, you know, as you say, there's a lot of history. A lot of things happened there. I remember Peter when he first started, took over from uh, Thudder Broslin. Yep, yep. Remember that, Pete? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's when things were just starting to turn around. I think the system started to realise then a rehabilitation didn't work. And so they had to go to humane containment. And we as officers had to treat them as humanely as possible. And that was very difficult, you know, when you cop all manner of abuse every day. But um, the place itself, I'll tell you, I think it's a heritage. It should be there. It should be there for people to see. I've done a couple of the tours. I did one of the functions there as a guest speaker for the uh, law department when they did a night there. And, um, and it's history. And, and Dennis, people, did you have a question for the panel? Well, the thing that upset me the most uh, in the discussions that happened was the fire in K-Division. Um, I don't think you quite covered that correctly. You know, we as officers did everything we could for in that situation. But, you know, those prisoners, yes, they... They arced up, they protested, and you have to understand the situa situation of Jica. It was all hydraulics. Every, you had to wait for a door behind you to shut before the door in front of you opened. And they stuck a, uh, they jimmed the door, they stuck a, a uh, broom in the door, and so it couldn't open. And they thought they had it beautifully planned. They had hoses in the toilets when they started the fire, and I thought all they had to do was just go into their cells breathe through the hoses in the toilets and everything could be okay. But it didn't happen that way. When the fire hit the roof and the fumes got through, it didn't last. And I think Peter mentioned that, that the learning from him was that that was a system that was not set up to, uh, correctly to, to save lives in that situation. We might move on to the next question. Dennis, thank you for your time this evening. Who's next? Just, can I ask just one question of Pat? Uh, hmm? uh, that uh, Jika, it was a... Uh, uh, AIDS and HIV, was it? Uh, well, we that, had... Did, did um, you lose many there, or what? Yes, uh, we had uh, Unit 3, which was the female uh, drug treatment, Unit 4, which was the male drug treatment, Unit 5 was the HIV, Unit 6 was the... Um, they called them the OIDS, the Intel uh, Office of Intellectually Disabled, which is now the EDS, and they 
uh, remained unit two, that remained as a high security unit, uh, still the same as it was when it was JICA. Another question? We've got about four minutes left if you, if you want to ask <laughs> Pat or Jack or Peter or Rupert anything about what it was like to wander over the site before people were using it. Yeah, hello, just a question to... Um, there are prisoners that are buried there. Mm -hmm. What's happened to those graves? Uh, well, Peter knows more about this than I do. Um, actually, they were um, exhumed originally and uh, they were then identified. I believe many of them have been returned to the grave site. However, um, Ned Kelly has been interred up at Greta Cemetery and Ronald Ryan is... Um, I'm not sure where, Peter. Where is he? Portland. Portland, yeah. With his wife, Dorothy. Yeah. So what about the other bodies, Peter? Well, the, there's, the still remains um, several who were executed in Pentridge and about 20 others that were, had been executed in the old Melbourne jail that were transferred back in 1927 when the Melbourne Workingmen's College was being built, RMIT extension. Uh, they still are not recognised. Uh, 15 years ago, I'd say, I had a commitment from the... Victorian government announcing that at least the burial site would be recognised in the names of the people buried there. Uh, but when nothing was happening with Ronald Ryan, I encouraged his daughter to exhume the body. And it was the last church funeral I did, just the three daughters at Tobin Brothers in North Melbourne, and he was um, cremated and placed with his wife Dorothy in Portland. The same with Ned Kelly, a, a number of people were advocating, but finally his remains were identified and he was uh, had a service at Wangaratta and he's, I go and visit uh, Ned every year or two at Greta Cemetery, but it's still an unmarked grave. Think about it, it wasn't safe to have a grave that would be marked, so there's a, there's a monument, a little plaque inside saying within this ground, is Ned and his mother and members of his family, but they're unmarked. Uh, so it's still not possible to uh, even put a memorial plaque there, because he's a cop killer. Um, but, uh, you know, why is it not possible for Ned Kelly to have a gravesite that wouldn't be vandalised? Uh, what, what is it about Australian society and our psyche? And are we going to move forward in this area or are we going to move backwards? Now, America for 30 years moved backwards and they imprisoned, two, from the time I visited there in 88, they put two million more people in prison. The first million had some effect on crime. The second million had no effect because they were warehousing the disadvantaged. And now America's changing, mm. but Australia's not. Yeah. And I predict we will keep going the way we're going for another 10, 15 years before the pendulum swings back and we start recognising what states like Texas and Florida are now recognising. It, it, you know, the cost was enormous, uh, but finally the pendulum swinging back in America, but not in Australia, not in Australia. We're, we've got 80 juveniles in custody in Victoria and Daniel Andrews, progressive Labor government, is building a 250-bed juvenile justice prison in Werribee South. No one, apart from, you know, youth workers and civil liberty people are complaining. So we're going to treble the size of the cells, despite the fact that juvenile crime in Victoria has been going down substantially for the last five years. Now, you're interested in prisons, and I would imagine very few people understand that. Juvenile crime has been going down dramatically in Victoria over the last five years. There's obviously some outstanding nasty crimes being committed, home invasions and carjackings, but overall, statistically. So we only have 80, but we're building a 250-bed prison. You know, no one really is saying much about it apart from civil liberty type people. And we've seen the responsibility move from Department of Human Services to Department of Justice, that will be interesting. Victoria led, led the field for decades uh, in this area, but now we've transferred it from the Human Services Department to the Department of Justice. Uh, and so the idea of rehabilitation, uh, I don't believe that you can rehabilitate 
put 250 kids together in the one unit. What's really needed is four small units, yep. one in Gippsland, yep. 15 bed, one in Bendigo, 15 bed, one in the western suburbs, 15 bed, not 250 bed facility. So those families from Gippsland that have kids going to custody, they've got to travel to South Werribee. They won't visit because they don't have cars often. And so connectedness you know, is the thing. If you remain connected to your community, to significant people, then you're less likely to act irresponsibly. You're less likely to be alienated. You're less likely to reoffend. So we're putting up a, a trebling the size, 250 bed prison, all in the one place in Werribee South. Yeah, we've. Uh, I've already, you know, spoken to um, the Jacomas in Aboriginal Justice and said we want, uh, you know, a, a place in that new new system down there in Werribee, because it's going to be, you know, it's going to be open, it's going to house, and, uh, but I have been able to get into the ears of adults and young ones in there, in our present system at the moment, and I've been telling them, uh, you know, giving them a heads up of what's happening, and they said, listen, the, the, uh, uh, it's become powerful, the, uh, uh, the jail system, privatisations of jails, uh, it seems, fellas, that, you know, that they, yeah, hands up, I ask, anybody that's been here three times, you know. Uh, and uh, most hands were raised. And I said, well, my contention is that uh, you've, uh, you're playing their game. Because there's no organisation outside for when you leave prisons, yeah, it's, you're doomed to failure. There's nobody counselling you out there. Even the parole system, there's very yeah. little ways of means of counselling or keeping a watch on you and et cetera. So um, the idea is that, uh, uh, that we are pushing to, um, to uh, the Archie Roach Foundation, we've even had a bus delivered to us, that we'd be in a p position to, um, to um, uh, pick up uh, families and take them in uh, for visitation rights, also pick them up from a submarine if we've had some success with the magistrates and instead of sending them to jail to take them down to, uh, for instance, the old uh, Wanderon jail now has been turned over to Aboriginal justice. Now, that's my favourite, country jail, mm -hmm. and that because, you know, I spent five years teaching Ceramica up to year 12 there, mm -hmm. and I taught a lot of people, but it was a way of life. I had it open seven days a week, eight to eight. So, consequently, this was at a time when the Office of Corrections were the clients of the education system. The education system had, had held sway over the, the measures that were allowed into, into that system and, uh, and, and it did well by us, did, did us justice, I thought. And you can find more information about the Archie Roach Foundation on, on the website. Thank you so much, Jack, Pat, Rupert and Peter. Thank you. <laughs>